What's up, Packers fans? Aaron Nagler here, and I am delighted to welcome in Emery Hunt, the czar of the playbook, Mr. CBS Sports himself, footballgameplan.com. Hey, Emery, what the hell? How are you, man? I haven't talked to you in forever. I know, man. I'm doing great, Aaron, man. Always a pleasure to see you, man. Glad we were able to catch up and talk ball. Always, man. Well, like, let's uh, let's talk 30,000-foot view of this draft, right? You are very much the draft expert that I love to speak with the most each and every year, simply because you really, really do the work when it comes to you know diving in not only to the big names that everybody knows and everybody kind of talks about ad nauseum for like a month, right, leading up to the draft, but you're on the ground in, in a lot of these small school games doing whether you're calling, whether you're going to pro days or – or our all-star games or what have you, but I love kind of your ability to look at the entirety of the draft class because you've done the work, like I said, throughout the last kind of year. And real quick, just to plug for Emery's uh, draft guide, I know we have one here at Cheesehead TV, but Emery is super legit when it comes to his stuff and his work on the draft guide. Make sure you check out his draft guide. I'll have it in the link below. Um, So looking at this draft, Emery, not, not we'll get into the Packers in a second, but overall, is there an impression that you come away with looking at this draft class as far as where the depth is, where maybe the shallow parts are, um, that top end of the draft? Everybody talks quarterbacks, but what other positions do you see kind of flying off the board? You know, early on, what's your impression of the 2023 draft? Well, and, and I'm, I'm glad you led up to that question with all the things that, that I've done and seen because it, it, it allows me to have a bigger picture view of, you know, the draft. Cause I, I don't particularly like when people say, Oh, this is a bad draft for this position, or this is a bad draft for that, but we get this position. Like now nah, every, every year is a great year for the draft because <laughs> of the amount of talent. Some years, yeah, the top may be a little bit more heavy than other positions, but overall the depth, is always there. And to specifically a- answer your question, I've said this before, this running back class reminds me of the year Aaron Jones and, you know, uh, Jamal Williams. And yeah, Jamal out, Williams right? Day came out that year. I want to say it's 2017 maybe. Right. Um, that draft class, because I feel like there are so many great running backs in this group. Um, and I also think just on the other side of it, I haven't, you know, and this was the last position I was able to study and grade. I don't think the safety class is as deep as it has been in terms of like the top end portion of it. And, right. and again, remember, I break it down into three spots, free safety, strong safety and combo safety, which is kind of like safeties that can cover. Right. Mm-hmm. And usually you find a bunch of guys that, that fit that mold. But this year it was, it was tough to find a bunch of guys to fit that combo safety mold. Do you think that's systemic? Do you think that's part of where the game is headed, or is it just a product of this particular year and you suspect things will be back to, quote, normal you know, in the years to come? I think it's a combination of uh, this year specifically, but also in a bigger scope, the, the, the fact that we, you know, we're seeing a lot of COVID plus guys, mm, right? right? So – Guys either going stuck back around, right? Yeah, guys coming out and and now they're 24 years old. This is their sixth season. They're coming out, or some guys decide, hey, I can go back for my sixth season. And so going going in to the draft classes, it makes it tough for evaluators because you really have to wait until that January 15th deadline to see who's actually in the draft class. Um, because guys can decide to go back and take that extra year, you know, so it's, it's tough. So you don't see guys, maybe next year you'll see a lot more combo safeties or whatnot. Right. Um, but I feel like once we're done with this COVID plus, you know, bonus season, hmm. I think we'll get back to normal and start to see, you know, classes equal out throughout. Looking at where the Packers are at 15 and uh, any number of picks thereafter, obviously we have to wait on the Aaron Rodgers trade to really get the firm grasp on what, it is exactly the Packers have to work with. But given where they're at right now, and you look at the 15th overall slot, you know, history would suggest you can get a pretty good player there. You know, you look through the history of the draft and who's been selected there. But you also have to look at the Packers history as far as what positions they like to take. And it is interesting to see, especially lately, you've seen a lot of tight ends drafted or mocked to the Packers. History would also suggest that that's probably not going to happen. But do you share the kind of conventional wisdom, so to speak, that – 
you know, I don't expect the Packers to take a tight end at 15, mostly because I've heard so much about how deep this tight end class is. Is that something you found when you're kind of breaking it down? Because everyone you talk to seems to suggest that, you know, if you do wait on a tight end, this is the draft class to do it. Well, everybody always loves – it's funny, like, everybody says the same thing, you know, but they never really – tell you why they they are saying this <laughs> right. um this year right. i feel like when people are talking usually again i break down the tight end class from flex tight ends in line h backs so it, from my perspective some years you may have oh man there's a bunch of in line guys that are really good and not that many h backs or not that many flex guys like i remember the cow pitts here it was really just cow mm-hmm. pitts and other guys right and right. as a flex guy and right. so this year i feel like when people are talking about is it being a deeper class i may expound on their just blanket comment right it's deep across the three spots so you could find a good you know amount of inline good amount of h backs a good amount of flex uh you know tight end types so yeah it's a deeper group across the board so i can agree with that assessment but just wanted to color in the lines a little right. bit no, i you know i feel you i feel you well, it's funny, too, because I, we had a chat kind of offline a couple of days ago regarding the Packers pass catchers in-house, right? Mm-hmm. And this idea that seems to percolate publicly, and especially from some people looking on the outside, looking in, and you talk about the Packers being bereft of talent at, at wide receiver. Obviously, they have to add to the room. I don't think anybody's dismissing that idea. But I, I, do, I do bristle a little bit as a Packers fan when you talk about, oh, you know, Jordan Love, the the cupboard is bare. It's like, did anyone watch the Packers <laughs> last year? I mean, Romeo Dobbs was no slouch, and we all saw how explosive and amazing Christian Watson was. And I think you look at Samari Torre, he barely got opportunities last year. So who knows what you have there? So I understand, yes, they will undoubtedly add a wide receiver in this draft. I'll be very surprised if they don't. But this idea that they've got nothing to work with is kind of funny to me. What, what do you think about that? I agree with you, man. It's bogus to me because think about it. Samari Toure, I had a higher grade on as well. And if you look at his skill set, it falls in line with Watson and Dobbs. I said this before on this show, like they have a type. Like if you're right. long and lean and can run, you fit their mold. I'll go even further. If we you know, pull back the layer and look at the XFL, who's one of the leading receivers in the XFL right now? Chris Blair out of all uh, he was Packers on the Packers legend. Roster. Right. <laughs> exactly. So it's not like these guys aren't talented. And Jeff Cotton was a physical receiver at Georgia Tech. We'll see him get an opportunity. And this is why I love covering so many prospects and doing a full view of a team's roster, because a lot of times the answer may already be on the roster that a guy that they've developed and been working with, and it's his time to hit the ground running. That's why they let this guy – go off in free agency or exactly. didn't sign this guy back. So, right. you know, if people dove deeper into these receivers or into prospects uh, in, in the draft, as they like to say they do, then they would know Torrey can ball. Torrey was a beast at Montana, then transferred and was a beast at Nebraska. And so I guarantee we're going to be talking about him like we've talked about Dubs and also Watson. So I'm not – the Packers, to me, if I'm sitting at 15 – I'm all in on one player in particular, and he's a defensive lineman that I want to see on Green Bay because I think he can be phenomenal. Oh, who is that? Oh, give us a name, Zara's oh, playbook. You want I'm listen, Brian Brissy would be perfect for Green Bay. I love he it. is someone that's 6'5, 300 pounds, can play any one of the techniques up front. Um, and I'm not saying he's this guy. Um, I'm just saying from a size perspective, mm-hmm. you don't see guys this big be like that up front <laughs> right. reggie white was was a guy that was a big defensive end like a six six 300 pound. you don't see dudes like that play in and mm-hmm. brissi can play in he could also play you know your five he can kick down and play a shade he could do a lot of things up front and he's gonna be you know last year he dealt with life so i'm not even looking at last year and like wow there was a drop off he dealt a lot off the field that you know can affect you on the field mm-hmm. so when he's healthy and when, you know, now that he's going to be a, another year removed from what happened last year, this dude is still a, a premier talent up front. And I think Green Bay getting better up front, you know, either side of the ball either side. is where they need to go. 
Totally you know? agree. It's funny you say that because it, it is that time of year where everyone's talking about they got to go get a wide receiver or they got to add a tight end. And I'm like, can we fortify both lines, please? <laughs> like, that's 100% to me, especially like it's so funny. I had someone in my mentions. I can't remember who it was. I'd love to give them a shout out. But they're like, everyone's out here talking about adding wide receivers like we didn't get run over by the Eagles on national television last year. It's like at some point you've got to be able to win up front on both sides of the ball. The reason they didn't make the playoffs last year is because they couldn't hold up up front against the Lions in that final game. It's like I love this idea. I love the idea of adding a defensive lineman early on in the draft, somebody who can control the trenches. I mean, we all know that's where the game is won and lost, and we all get kind of talk about it like leading up to the Super Bowl, right, talking about the Chiefs or, or the Eagles and, oh, they've got these great lines. Well, that didn't just happen. You've right. got, to, in, you've got to invest uh, along – and here's the other thing. This is what, another reason I love talking to you, Emery, is that like, okay, we can talk about the 15th pick, and plenty of people will, but I'd love to talk to you about day three. You know, this idea that we always go through it every single year. The first selection gets made, whoever it is, on either side of the ball, and because of the way the draft is set up now, you've got 24 hours to pick it apart and talk about what who it is and what they should have done and how they won or lost the first day of the draft. And it's like, there's six more rounds. So with that in mind, if we go to day three, and that's where, you know, Brian has made a ton of selections. He kept everybody from his draft class last year. I suspect with a team and transition, especially trying to get out of a salary cap kind of purgatory that they've been in because of Aaron Rodgers and trying to run it back, you got to think there's a good chance that a lot of these day three guys will have opportunities is there anybody, Are there? Is there a prospect or two that you can think of off the top of your head where, w- whether it's wide receiver, whether it's tight end, or may- maybe on the defensive side, maybe it's an edge, some a guy or two who could possibly have a pathway to playing time. And I'm not saying they're going to come in and be a starter right away. Day three guys who could contribute, guys who probably have a chance to at least compete in training camp and make a name for themselves. There, there's two, and it's all defense for me. Um, I, I can it. give you a, a receiver, but I, I'll say defensively, um, and I'll start top down. I'll look at safety, combo safety, Xavier Bell out of Portland State. You you watch him play against Washington, and you watch him play against San Jose State. Portland State moves him around across the, the back end. So he can play corner on the boundary side. He can play inside versus – you know, slot receivers are bigger inside receivers. He can man up against tight ends. He can blitz off the edge. He is someone, he's six, one and a half, close to the six to 205 pounds. Oh, Did a yeah. great there job down. Yeah. So he's right he in can, their wheelhouse. Yeah. <laughs> right. He's perfect. He's height, weight, speed guy. Great college gridiron showcase. Great career at Portland State, too. Um, so he's someone to keep an eye on. And um, Bethel. You, there's two Bethel universities, first of all. There, mm-hmm. This is the one I'm talking about that's in Tennessee. So gotcha. this is an NAIA program. Uh, it's the Bethel Wildcats. And his defensive lineman, Daryl Middleton. Um, what's crazy about him is, you know, obviously you want to dominate on film. And he's 6'6", 305. So he's another one of these guys that can play any one of the techniques. But obviously you want to see guys dominate on, on film. But don't even go watch his, his Bethel – tape because it's, it's it won't do you any justice this dude was he played at university of tennessee so he's an sec caliber player so you already know what the bethel tape is going to look like but mm-hmm. at tennessee he was dominant and was you know making things happen up front before you know fell out of favor had to transfer mm-hmm. ended up at bethel which is an naia program so again this dude reminds me a lot of eric swan you remember him oh, yeah. um, he was nice. someone that played semi-pro ball that ended up getting drafted in the first round, like top right. 10 to 15, you know what I'm saying? That was unheard of then in what, 91 or 90 or one of those Old years? Old school, yeah, yeah, yeah. Old Early school. 90s, I know that. Early 90s. Right. And so not saying Middleton are going in round one, but we're talking about day three. I'll take a flyer on him. Someone that's that big, that's that versatile, that whose tape is ridiculous, but also had a really good week at the Hula Bowl. Um you know, showing he still has that SEC type of skill set, athleticism, going up against other FBS players uh, down in Orlando. So, yeah, those two guys Love are it. tremendous. And, and and those two guys, to me, really stood out as, uh, you know, players I think would be ideal fits for Green Bay. 
Well, how many do you go? How many All Star games do you go to? Because I know you do like you're calling games during the year, but then I see you on your social media, hardest working man in show business over here. Like, how many of the uh, do you go to the NFLPA Bowl? Like, how many? How many do you end up at? I went to all eight this year, man. You're crazy. Oh, You're crazy. Senior Bowl, Shrine Game. Oh, let me start in order. Right. <laughs> FCS Bowl was in December. Then right. it was the College Gridiron Showcase. Then it was the the Hula Bowl. Then it was the Tropical Bowl. Then NFL PA. Then Shrine Game. Then Senior Bowl. And then HBCU Legacy Bowl down in New Orleans in late February, a week before the combine. That's right. Man, you hard, I tell you, man, you need you need help. You need, <laughs> you, need, you need some help, man. I understand you want to get there and you want to see these guys, but man, that's a that's a trip and a half. That's crazy. The, who okay, here's my other question. When you're on the circuit, right? Like we're this whole thing from the moment college kind of season, so to speak, ends, right? Mm-hmm. And then you do the whole kind of bit through the combine and then even through pro days into the draft. Is there a is there a program that does it right that that kind of jumps out a little bit more whether it's you know the school or uh, one of the all star games like is there someone along that circuit who kind of maybe is a little head and shoulders above the rest or are they all pretty similar? It, it, that's a great question, and um, they're all pretty similar, right? So the the events are all pretty similar. Mm-hmm. Um, if I had just a pet peeve, I wish the HBCU Legacy Bowl moved it to December. Because having those guys perform a week before the combine is not doing anybody. Right. Anybody, you know, you're yeah. not getting scouts, a lot of scouts down there, and the guys don't want to work out because they got the combine. If they all oh, pro days that are break it, so but all the games run differently. But I will say this: I noticed this this cycle, and certain cycles I I noticed certain things. But this year specifically, um, man, Southern Miss, BYU, and Texas A and M Commerce. It's like those guys like understood the assignment, <laughs> dominating at all the different all star. Anywhere right. I saw, oh, an Appalachian State defensive backs. Anywhere I saw any one of those, like a Southern Miss player, right, was, like stood out. Texas A and M Commerce stood out, and then BYU in multiple games, separate players stood out on both sides of the ball. That's interesting. Um, so it's it, it was fascinating to see which programs guys kind of stood out consistently right on a collective so that was something unique from this season i love it i love it you see emory this is why i love talking to you man we got like, we say this every year we got to do this more often like this is really you know, do. I, I, it is my it is on me it is my fault I, I will make it happen uh hopefully we'll see you draft weekend on the cheesehead tv live stream at some point uh i'm gonna be all alone for much of it Corey's traveling so i'm gonna be Uh-oh. in desperate need of folks to talk to so hopefully <laughs> hopefully you, you can stop on by like i said make sure you check out emory's stuff uh his draft guide dropped just recently i'll have the link down below for you emory <laughs> thank you so much i really appreciate the time man always a pleasure man i'm a big fan of what you do and what you've done in your career and also a big fan of you know packer nation and cheesehead nation they, they are some of the more knowledgeable football fans out there you know it's not like just shooting from the hip these guys actually know balls so love talking to Packer fans thanks a lot man I'll talk to you soon